In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his hate as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. His wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousand, thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast... Their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him, the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with his teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stemmed what was left with his feet. 
and about the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, and horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seems greater than his companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and a time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. And for the ten horns out of the kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is God's word. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Sam. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you're with us for the first time, you've logged in at the end of our series from Daniel. Uh, We haven't got to the end of the book, but we're up to chapter 7. We'll do the rest of the book uh, later on. Uh, Last time we were looking at Daniel, chapter 6, we uh, saw Daniel's faithfulness, God's faithfulness to Daniel uh, in rescuing him from the lion's den. It's an amazing story and all-time favourite, I'm sure. Um, But The question uh, occurs to us, doesn't it? What happens if God doesn't rescue his people from the lions? Uh, When we left Daniel chapter 6, the people who had been opposing Daniel, they were thrown into the lion's den and their bones were crunched up before they hit the ground, before they hit the bottom of the pit. Um, But we know from church history and some of us know from personal experience Uh, God does not always rescue us uh, from those who oppose us. Uh, Here's an example from church history. Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, he followed on from Peter. There he is being crunched by the lions uh, as he was thrown into the lion's pit on the 6th of July, 108 AD, just 75 years after Jesus died on the cross. Uh, As he neared Death, he said this, now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, breaking bones, tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ. What a brave man as he faced the lions, and of course, he died. Uh, Here's a more modern example. This happened in June this year, the Christian village of Sabamida in Mali. Uh, More than 100 men, women and children were massacred uh, by jihadists who came into the village. Uh, Here they are preparing uh, to bury those 100 plus people. Here's a picture of their church. If you're in their church this morning, 
And somebody said, oh, we've got a guest here. Would you like to say something to our congregation? What would you say if you were standing behind that mud brick pulpit? What would you say to these people who had a hundred of their families and friends taken from them? Probably more importantly, what what does God say to people like that uh, who have suffered incredibly? Well, our passage today helps us uh, as we face a world in which there is so much injustice and so often it's directed at God's people. Lou was praying for the 250 million plus Christians around the world today uh, who are facing persecution. Well, before we get into the chapter, let's just note here that there's a change of pace uh, in verse 1 of chapter 7. This section of Daniel from here on is about dreams and visions that Daniel has. In the past, he's been interpreting other people's visions and dreams, but now uh, he has some of his own. Um, So far in the book of Daniel, chapters 1 to 6, it's what we call court narratives. It's what's going on in the halls of power, the corridors of power in Babylon. But now it turns to a very different kind of literature. And actually the language changes, it switches from Aramaic into Hebrew. Um, So that also gives us a clue. And it's dreams and visions and their interpretation. It's like we're switching from reading a history book uh, to watching a movie. That's how big the switch is that's going on here. And uh, as I said, the rest of the book is about four visions that Daniel has and about their interpretation. Uh, We're going to do the first one today and we'll do the rest later sometime. So this literature is what we call apocalyptic. It's become known and you've heard people say, talk about the apocalypse, by which we normally mean the end of the world. But apocalyptic actually just means unveiling, revealing. Uh, Now, all scripture is God revealing, isn't it? It's God's revelation. Um, But this is a particular kind of God revealing. He's drawing the curtain back a bit uh, on what's going to happen in the future. And it's highly symbolic. As uh, Sally was reading that, you heard all these weird images and numbers and stuff like that, seasons and things. It all just really, really unusual pictures. Um, and we know, of course, that it's symbolic because the interpretation of it says, well, this is like that, as, uh, as Daniel is told what it means. Uh, this means that. Uh, now, some people have taken this as licence to do the same thing and, and, and read endless uh, sort of all sorts of things into the meaning of this. Um, Some of you may have read the uh, Left Behind series. It's a fictional series. It's based on some of these apocalyptic books. Uh, But what we're going to do this morning is actually see how does the text itself interpret those visions Uh, because that's what we must stick to. Now, apocalyptic isn't written to give us every detail of what's going to happen in every age. Uh, The interpretation actually that's given here is very brief. It's just in two sentences, two verses. But apocalyptic gives us the big picture, the broad strokes of what God is doing uh, in the face of the hardship of his people. That's what's being addressed. These things are written uh, for the comfort of God's people who are suffering hardship. So we actually need to stand back and look at the broad strokes uh, of this picture. Now, while these, these are dreams and visions, they are rooted in history. Uh, you'll notice from verse 1 that it happened Uh, to a particular person, Daniel, one of the exiles in Babylon. Uh, And the time was 550 BC. It was in the reign of King Belshazzar, the first year of Belshazzar's reign, uh, which you know from history is about 550 BC. Immediately you will notice that this is out of sequence with the first six chapters. So last week when we did chapter 6, we noted that that was 539 BC, uh, when, uh, when the Medes and the Persians came and took over Babylon. Uh, but this is going back 15 or 16 years to the beginning of Belshazzar's reign. So Belshazzar is the last of the Babylonian kings. So what do we see in this vision? Well, there are creeps from the deep. Um, 
Uh, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? In Australia, uh, we love the sea, don't we, I think? 85% of us live within 50 kilometres of the sea. The most expensive houses are the ones near the water. And for most of us, I think the sea is like a friend. It's a place where we go to relax, uh, to enjoy ourselves, go for a walk. Janet and I love to go down the bay and have a walk along the beach on our day off or somewhere else, Western Port. It just seems to be so peaceful and calm. So when we read verses 2 and 3 uh, that talk about the sea being stirred up by winds and, and these creepy creatures coming out of it, uh, <laughs> there's something different going on there, isn't there? And it's because to the, these people, to the Babylonians uh, and also uh, to the Jews who were largely agricultural people, they were farmers and most of them didn't live near the sea. For them, the sea is a scary place. Who knows how deep it is? And who knows what monsters and creepy crawlies are in there? I remember once taking a, our language helper in Pakistan uh, to go to Karachi and he had never seen the sea before. And I took him out to the beach and uh, he just stood there open mouth. He said, what's all that noise? I said, oh, that's the waves coming in. And there were a few ships out there. He said, are they, are they sitting on the bottom or are they floating? He, but the, he, he had no idea as I would have had no idea if I hadn't seen the sea before. And this is what the, the Jews and the Babylonians were like. The, the sea to them was an unknown place, a place of chaos. Uh, and particularly for the Canaanites and the Babylonians, uh, in their creation stories, uh, the created order came to be through the fighting of the sea god and the god of order, the god of chaos and the god of order. The god of chaos lived in the sea and they had this massive battle. And, and when it all settled down, uh, what we see in front of us was left over in our world. Of course, the Genesis account, very different, isn't it? The sea, yeah, it might be a scary place, an unknown place, but it's very definitely under the sovereign control of God. Right at the beginning, the Spirit of God broods over the waters. So these beasts uh, come up out of the sea. Uh, place of chaos and destruction. They represent uh, chaos and destruction. Uh, they have their origin in chaos and their character is destruction. Uh, here's somebody's attempt at uh, to doing a picture of those beasts. And you notice that some of them are hybrids. Uh, they're, they're composites, lion and eagle and leopards and with wings and stuff like that. I think this impacts us as something weird, something from some sort of horror movie or sci-fi thing or whatever. Um, but for the, the Jew that's familiar with the Old Testament, these are horrendous. Because you see right at the beginning of creation, God created all the animals and beasts after their kind. And later on when the law came, it was forbidden uh, to interbreed them, to try and crossbreed them. Uh, so much so that you actually couldn't plant two different kinds of seeds in the same paddock. And because God was saying, no, I've created these things as they are. You enjoy them and use them uh, as I created them. So these hybrid beasts are some sort of bloodthirsty, anti-God, power-hungry, barbarous kind of symbol. And the last one tops it off. He's got teeth like steel. Uh, chewing up everything and trampling everything that survives. And he has 10 horns. Uh, the only use of a horn on a beast is to destroy something else, to attack something else. And, uh, and, uh, and all this is symbolic of brutal regimes that are opposed to God. Now, even though these beasts are frightening and ugly, uh, they aren't all powerful. The first three are under orders, if you read there. He was given the heart of a man. Who's he given the heart of a man by? Well, we're not told, uh, but this beast looks a lot like Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't he? So he's brought down and Nebuchadnezzar was made like an animal and then he, when he recognised who God is, he was raised up again by God. Uh, the second one, the bear-like one, is told to get up and eat 
He's full of flesh. Again, we're not told by whom, uh, but he's under orders. The third one, the leopard-like one with four heads, is given authority to rule. So again, he's under orders. And the fourth one uh, that really isn't described fully except for its huge teeth um, by which it crushes its victims in verse 7, it's certainly under God's orders uh, as we're going to see. Now, who these beasts represent has been the cause of lots and lots of speculation. Uh, and there are, and there will, will continue to be. Uh, there are some ideas, uh, this one's gained quite a bit of traction, uh, where it's lined up with the image in uh, Daniel 2. And we had those four kingdoms there, those four kings, and uh, people who uh, take this line say that the first one's Babylon, then it's the Medo Persian Empire, then it's the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. Uh, some people say it stops at the Greek Empire. Uh, there's a map. If you want to see where those kingdoms extended to, you probably can't read that from there, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> uh, but it, it's probably actually better to stand back a bit and take these kings as, as a representative of every kind of human power that doesn't bow the knee to God and who continue in their lust for power and blood uh, in their own way. By the way, it's interesting uh, when nations these days uh, choose a, a, a beast or an animal or a bird to represent them, uh, they tend to be predatory ones. You're probably familiar with the one on the left, the one in the middle, you will know, an eagle, and the one on the right, the lion, and uh, the Russians uh, like the bear. Um, this is weird, isn't it? Then when we, when we think of the power of nations, that we choose these kind of animals that rip other animals apart. Uh, it's pretty weird, isn't it? The Aussies chose the vegetarian ones, didn't they? The, um, <laughs> the emu and the kangaroo, uh, which apparently can't go backwards. That represents that we only go forwards. Make of that what you will. Um, <coughs> but the big picture of this is that rebellion against God is a very, very ugly thing. And we actually know that from our own experience, don't we? That when we rebel against God, it's not a pretty sight. We harm ourselves and we harm the people around us. And our world is full of stuff like that. So that's the creeps from the deep. Well, these creeps crash in verses 9 to 12. And uh, here's what Daniel sees, as I looked, the thrones were placed, the Ancient of Days took his seat, clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire, stream of fire issued and came out from before him, a thousand thousand served him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Now here's a huge switch in the narrative here, isn't there? All of a sudden we're going from these weird destructive animals, chaos and destruction, to order. And uh, this great king, this incredible uh, picture of God that Daniel sees, seated on a throne uh, with clothing as white as snow, hair like wool and it speaks of purity, of course. And the throne's on fire and its wheels are blazing like a V8 production car, except it's real. And it speaks of the purifying fire of God's judgment. And why has it got wheels? Because God's judgment can go anywhere. It's mobile. It just doesn't rain in some temple somewhere or in some country somewhere. No, his Rule and reign and his judgment will reach the ends of the world and the ends of the universe. So this blazing justice and holiness of the Ancient of Days is in stark contrast, isn't it, to the bloodthirsty beast who seek to destroy. Rather than consuming people, this Ancient of Days is attended by thousands of people and hundreds of millions stand before him. Shades of revelation, isn't it? Well, the court is seated and the books are opened. And notice here that this judgment is based on truth. 
It's not based on the whim of the power of the one in charge, like the beast rampaging around and consuming whoever and whatever they want. No, this is a really ordered process. The books are open, the facts, the truth is brought out of what people have done and they receive their just deserts. And these beasts, the last beast is destroyed and the three other beasts, their dominion is taken away from them and they last for a little while longer. But there's one figure who isn't treated this way and that's the Son of Man. And that's the third point on your outline. Out of all this chaos, we see that the Son of Man rules. Verse 13, of course, this is the centre of this passage. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So this son doesn't come out of chaos. Where does he come from? He comes from heaven, uh, out of the clouds, on the clouds. So often in the Bible, the presence of God is associated with clouds. A cloud goes before God's people uh, as they go through the desert to the promised land. A cloud envelops Jesus as he's changed and transfigured before uh, his disciples. And God speaks from heaven as that cloud envelops Jesus. And a cloud envelops Jesus, of course, as he is taken back to heaven. So the Son of Man comes out of heaven, out of order, not out of chaos. And the Ancient of Days recognises him. And uh, what happens next is extraordinary. Note that Daniel is a monotheistic Jew. And what he knows from the Bible, that the Lord is one Lord, him only shall you serve. There is one Lord, one God, and you'll serve only him. But what happens with this Son of Man? To him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So here the Son of Man approaches the throne of the Ancient of Days and he's given all authority, all power to rule all peoples, not just the Jews, but all the nations of the earth, all language groups. And the kingdom he's given is an eternal one. Unlike all the others that have come before, his kingdom will be indestructible and it will go on forever. Now, you've probably noticed already that that this term, the Son of Man, is of course the term that Jesus took for himself. 71 times in the Gospels, Jesus uses this title. Of course, it's the perfect title, isn't it? For one who comes from heaven, uh, who was with God and was God, as John tells us, but also is fully human. The one who came to usher in this eternal kingdom and who took up the language of these verses when he was on trial uh, before the Jewish Sanhedrin, just hours before he was crucified. So the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. It deliberately takes this language of Daniel 7 and and applies it to himself. He's claiming I am the rightful owner of God's kingdom. I am the one. I am the son of man, the one to whom the ancient of days has given all power and authority uh, and glory. That's why, and, and, and Jesus came actually to not only show us that kingdom, to announce that kingdom as he did, the kingdom of God is at hand, his first words in his ministry, but also to call people to enter it and to open up the way so that we could enter it. And that's why he constantly says that the Son of Man must suffer and die and rise again because that's the means by which 
people enter his kingdom. But notice here, finally, it's not just the son who rules. The saints rule in the last half of the chapter. Daniel, of course, is freaked out by this nightmare, you'd have to call it. There's so much in it that's so bewildering uh, to him uh, and also to us who haven't experienced this vision. So he turns to one of the people there and says, what does this mean? Uh, So verses 17 and 18, where you get the interpretation of the vision. These four beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. That's it. That's the interpretation. Don't say who they are, when they'll come. Don't say anything, except that the four kings will rise out of the earth. But, he says, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. It's a very simple interpretation. Four kingdoms will come from the earth, but the saints will get the kingdom forever. That's the focus of this. Actually, you'd expect him to say all these kingdoms and beasts are going to come up, but God will overcome them all. But he says, actually, the saints will inherit the earth. The saints will inherit the kingdom. What a wonderful thing that is. These rotten regimes that blight the earth and still do will not endure. That's the message here. And, and that's the story of the world, isn't it? Nero, Domitian, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, ISIS, Boko Haram. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? And it will go on and on. Now, that's the point of this. These things will keep rising up uh, from the earth. But the saints will rule. This is the message to God's people. You guys will be part of the eternal kingdom of the Son of Man. But before that happens, the saints are going to suffer. Before they rule with Jesus, the saints will suffer for him. Now, verse 21, as I looked, this horn, that little loud-mouthed horn, made war with the saints and prevailed over him, the boastful one, wages war uh, on God's people and defeats them until the Ancient of Days pronounces judgment in their favour. Now, some people see this horn as the Roman uh, Empire, others see it as the Greek Empire, and this little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes who, who laid siege to the temple uh, and, uh, and, and apparently laid siege to it for three and a half years before relief came. So that's the times, the times and the time and a half. Uh, Make of that what you will as well. It's pretty hard to work it out and different people have made different things of it as different kings have arisen out of the earth. And I think that's how God intends us to look at it. The main message is uh, that relief will come, that this will end for those who are caught up in it. It will last for a time, times and a half uh, in verse 26 which means it's a limited time and then it will end. It will end suddenly, it'll be cut off, it'll be destroyed forever. Uh, Verse 26, but the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion, the dominion of that horn, shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. In the meantime, the saints will suffer and then these poor suffering saints will receive the kingdom. In verse 21, Uh, This horn makes war with the saints in verse 21, sorry, verse 22, until the Ancient of Days comes and judgment is given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Notice, friends, that the saints are given that kingdom. Uh, but it's the king alone who is worshipped. As you go to uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation 13, by the way, it's very similar to what we see here in Daniel. Revelation 14, you see there the saints, the full number of them, 144,000 are ruling uh, with Christ. Uh, So this is an amazing message to these exiles. 
uh, people who are oppressed and enslaved by a foreign power. These weak ones will be part of the ruling uh, kingdom of the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days. Uh, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, takes up this theme 600 years later uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. He says there to the suffering saints, around about 64, 65 AD, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. The title of this sermon is The Future, the future Belongs to the Son. And friends, what's our role here as we suffer in various ways? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We wait for the Son. We endure with him and we will reign with him. Now, it's the same promise is given in Revelation 2 to the church in Thyatira. The one who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Yes, Jesus will rule, but we will rule with him. What a wonderful uh, thought that is. We'll be part of the eternal, forever, indestructible, perfect rule of God. Well, the obvious question for us all this morning is, are we part of this kingdom? I want to ask you that this morning. Are you part of this kingdom, God's indestructible kingdom through Christ? Or are you still in some sort of beastly way holding out against the God, against God the King, thinking that somehow you will survive his rule and his scrutiny when the books are opened? And everything that you've done, every word that I've spoken, every deed that I've thought that I've had will be exposed and laid bare. Now, friends, if you have not trusted Jesus for forgiveness this morning, if you've not put your faith in what he has done for you on that cross as he bore that judgment for our sins, let me encourage you to do it. This kingdom, this rule of God will come. So trust Jesus. He died on the cross for you. He died to defeat the powers of sin and darkness once for all. What about if you have responded, that you know Christ, that you're part of God's kingdom? Uh, Friends, we need to live faithfully. Through Jesus, there will be ultimate victory. Uh, Whatever beasts are opposing you and opposing God, uh, friends, we need to live faithfully. Uh, for Jesus. Uh, the, this message actually is the same for the people uh, living in that village in Mali, isn't it? Grieving their loved ones. Hang in there. God has already made judgment in your favour in the death of Jesus on the cross. You will be in his eternal kingdom if you trust him. The time of suffering may be fierce and ferocious, but it's limited. There's a full stop at the end of it, which will be put there by Jesus when he returns. It will all gloriously end with his return and we'll reign with him. So that's how we live uh, with faith uh, in a divided world. Uh, We can take the hits for Jesus. The beastly opposition that sometimes comes to us in our workplace or in our communities because we trust in Christ. And the worst things that happen to our brothers and sisters around the world, uh, we can take that because we know that that's temporary and that what is coming is forever. Let's close with verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Uh, Friends, let's bow in prayer uh, as we respond to God's word. Uh, Maybe today you want to surrender to him for the first time in your life and say, Jesus, I want to trust what you did on that cross. I know I will not survive when the books are open and the judgment comes. Maybe you want to cry out to God for help uh, for some beastly thing that you're facing. Uh, Cry out for God's help to be faithful to the Lord Jesus. Let's take a moment to respond and then I'll lead us in prayer.
Our Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, this chaotic world is uh, not out of control, but that you know all things and that you are all powerful and that you will put a stop uh, to all this rebellion against you and against your people. Uh, Lord, help us to prepare for that day that we ourselves might be ready, that we might know that the judgment that's coming our way uh, has been dealt with because of what you did for us on the cross. Lord, I pray for all of us here today that we might surrender to the Lord Jesus and trust in him. And Lord, please help us to live faithfully in this divided world. Lord, help us to recognise that we are dual citizens, that we live in this world, but we are ultimately destined for heaven, for your kingdom. Uh, Lord, help us to be faithful in the face of trials and persecution. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing this this morning. We pray for that little village in Mali, for those people, Lord, as they pick up the pieces of their lives. May you give them such a vision of the Lord Jesus and how great he is and of your coming kingdom that will allow them to to persevere and to go on. And Lord, we pray for ourselves where our temptations and the opposition is much more soft and subtle. Lord, help us to see it, to stand up for you and to live faithfully for you as citizens of your coming kingdom. And we pray it in your name. Amen.